He is co-author of a new, brand new book that literally was just released this month called Discovering the Deep, a photographic atlas of the seafloor and ocean crust. It's going to be a textbook for the next generation. It has the latest explanations of plate tectonic theories along with fantastic pictures of which we'll see many tonight. Dr. Carson has degrees in geology from the Case Institute of Technology and the State University of New York at Albany. He has taught and done research at many places, including Woods Hole, Caltech, Duke University, and the University of Washington. President, presently, Dr. Carson holds the Jesse Page Heroy Professorship and Chair, Department of Earth Sciences at Syracuse University, where he is called Lava Man. Please help me welcome tonight's speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Carson. Well, Dave, thanks so much for that very warm, if somewhat exaggerated, <laughs> introduction. I, you know, when you get an introduction like that, you feel like you have to live up to uh, some of the things that are said. Uh, anyhow, tonight I want to uh, take you to the bottom of the ocean and talk a little bit about uh, kind of geology that very few people get to see. Uh, before starting, though, I want to thank the Society for inviting me down here. Uh, really looking forward to this and so happy that all of you can join us uh, tonight. And I also want to thank, in particular, Linda and Charles Sternbach for just being the most fantastic hosts ever uh, today. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many uh, old friends and acquaintances here tonight. And uh, really uh, looking forward to telling you a little bit about uh, some of the material that's in this new book we've just published. And some of those things include the volcanoes that are hidden from our sight on the bottom of the ocean, some giant fault zones that uh, are out of sight, out of mind, and yet have a very terrific geological impact on our planet, and also some exotic life forms. In fact, anytime we're talking about mid-ocean ridges and the processes of seafloor spreading that create the seafloor, we're really talking about the integration of geology, fluids, and uh, biology. And I know these are not, not new topics to people in the oil business, who are many of whom are here tonight, uh, but let's have a little bit different take on that here. Okay, this place should look somewhat familiar to you. Usually when we see a globe like this, we see this bimodal distribution, right? The, the blue ocean and the brown looking sort of continents. And one thing I want to remind you is that two thirds of our planet's covered with water. It's underlain by oceanic crust, which is different from the crust of the continents. And it's that oceanic crust we want to talk about tonight. Uh, one of the most, uh, the largest, probably most continuous uh, geologic structure on our entire planet is underwater. It's the mid-ocean ridge system that you can see running down, at least part of it, running down through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, runs for 65,000 kilometers around the planet kind of like the seams on a baseball. You know, most people's attitude is uh, something like these nice ladies in the future. You know, I don't really know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean. Uh, but it's mainly because no one ever tells them. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about it tonight. Okay, well, the seafloor. Uh, this map shows the age of the seafloor. The red areas are the youngest. The darker uh, colors are uh, older seafloor. The seafloor is created at that mid-ocean ridge system. You can see it, branches of it running all around the planet here, outlined by red. Uh, the seafloor is created there and spreads laterally away. As it does so, it carries the uh, continental plates along with it and the process of plate tectonics. Seafloor spreading is one of the fundamental parts of plate tectonics, and it allows for the growth of the oceans. In fact, the continuous repaving of the seafloor, this repaving of the seafloor is accomplished by making new seafloor at those mid-ocean ridges, and then destroying it, or recycling it, actually, at around the Pacific in particular, at subduction zones. Right? Now, this process has gone on for at least the last couple billion years. So when we look at our planet, we can't just think of the seafloor as being just two-thirds of the planet, but actually an area that's been repaved over and over and over again, and that uh, first-order planetary process of seafloor spreading, the main way that the Earth loses heat and uh, brings material from the deep interior of the Earth to the surface. 
This spectacular mountain range, as I mentioned before, has uh, huge rift valleys that rival those of the East African Rift, huge fault zones that, and uh, deep uh, valleys that make the Grand Canyon look like just a small scratch on the surface of the Earth. Uh, and we use uh, various types of techniques to investigate the mid-ocean ridges. We've known a little bit about how seafloor spreading works, but what I'm going to talk about tonight mainly uh, is about how we investigate the geology of the seafloor on these mid-ocean ridges. As many people know here, it's those rocks and rock relationships that speak to us about processes. It's how we learn about seafloor spreading. In general, we know this is what's going on. As plates are pulled apart, as these big arrows suggest, the material deep in the earth rises in a ductile kind of gooey way toward the surface as indicated by these white arrows and turns the corner and rolls over as these plates at the surface move apart. Uh, the black lines show the path of melt that's generated as this material rising from deep in the earth's mantle, uh, decompression melting goes on, it sort of begins to sweat as it reaches the surface and magma accumulates near the surface of the earth uh, in magma chambers that you can see near the top of this illustration. Some of that material leaks out on the seafloor, making new lava flows. So this is how new oceanic crust is created. We look at the top of that system, we see magma bodies, as you can see the big red blob at the bottom here. As the seafloor is pulled apart, cracks develop, and some of that material leaks to the surface, as shown in those red vertical lines. These are called dikes. These are uh, basically frozen conduits of magma leaking out toward the surface, and they sort of fill those big cracks. It sort of tries to heal this wound in the earth that keeps opening up and trying to heal itself. Some of that material spills out on the surface, making lava flows. And of course, it's just the top of this system, for the most part, that we can investigate on the seafloor, because like most extensional systems, we pull material apart, we keep building up on the surface, and some of the deep level material continues to, continues to be buried. But we do have a few techniques that allow us to get to that, that we'll talk about in just a minute. The overall view of seafloor spreading is that we're creating a rather simple layered geological crust to the earth under the oceans. I mean, this is a simplifying factor, right? I mean, two-thirds of the planet, the planet is underlain by this oceanic crust, but it's relatively simple compared to the continents, at least we think it is. It's made up of a layer of lavas at the surface, shown here in green, the dikes shown in that light blue color, in what we call a sheeted dike complex, a place where those dikes are all intruded side by side, each one representing a crack that was healed by magma as the plates are pulled apart. Beneath that, in the darker blue color, uh, rocks that crystallize slowly deep in the earth make coarse-grained, what we call gabroic rocks. Now, these lavas, the dikes, and the gabbros are all about the same composition. They just have slightly different grain sizes, slightly different structures associated with them by virtue of the way they're, they're intruded into the crust. Uh, beneath the blue part, beneath the crust, is the earth's mantle. Now, which is made up of olivine-rich, that is, uh, magnesium silicate-rich rocks, very dense rocks, uh, from which that uh, crustal material is derived. So, at the mid-ocean ridges, in the rift valleys, as shown here, uh, that <coughs> new oceanic crust is sort of manufactured, and all of the ocean floor is basically created by a machine that looks something like this, or at least variations on that thing. Uh, one of the variations occurs because of the rate at which the plates are moving apart. In places where the plates are moving apart very fast, lots of magma is generated. It's a very efficiently operated machine. And we make a nice, simple, layered structure. Uh, the shape of the uh, spreading center, uh, when we go across it, it sort of looks like a, a volcano, a very long volcano elongated along the spreading center. But when we go to slow spreading ridges, as shown in the bottom illustration, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, for example, that's only separating at about, oh, uh, about two centimeters per year, 
uh, we see that faulting dominates. A huge rift valley can develop, just like in the East African Rift, for example. And we just have sort of a sputtering magmatic system where there's just a little bit of magma being intruded periodically, and the faulting tends to break up that material uh, in a very violent way. And just, we're going to look at some examples of both of those types of situations and look at some of the geology and some of the interesting uh, features that form in those types of settings. Okay. To do this, we need to look at the rocks, right? Uh, I have to say that, that, you know, geology is the autobiography of the earth, but it's written in the rocks. And this is true of all sorts of geological environments, and certainly the oceanic crust is no exception. You know, the field of marine geology is only about 50 years old, really. I mean, at least in, to the extent that we are looking at that most oceanic basement rocks. I mean, the earliest oceanography, of course, modern oceanography, began in the last uh, two centuries ago with the voyage of the Beagle. And Charles Darwin, sailing around the world, even found that lowering weights on, uh, on long ropes, they found that there's shallow areas in the middle of the oceans. It was the first hint that the mid-ocean ridges might be there. The progress was really slow until the 1960s. Up to that time, uh, basically, we just started to begin to collect uh, some data to show the shape of the bottom of the oceans. <coughs> and the only rock samples were obtained with these dredge, dredges, just a, a chain bag that was dragged along the bottom of the ocean. And so these were uh, not very high resolution samples, you could say. They just gave us a, the barest reconnaissance sort of glimpse of what the oceanic crust might look like. So this is sort of where I entered the picture and, um, and my interests in looking at the bottom of the ocean. I was very lucky to have people that took me along on oceanographic uh, research cruises and got me into this. And I uh, spent, well, 30 or 40 years now uh, pursuing this. So one of my first cruises, I remember distinctly going on an oceanographic research vessel like this. You know, you go away from port and you suddenly realize as the shoreline disappears, you're not going to be back for another month. You're not going to see land for another month. And, uh, you know, steam along and these ships travel at about the rate you ride a bicycle. So it's like riding your bicycle to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. You know, it takes a few days. And when you get out there, and I don't know what I was expecting to find at that time, but you know, there's only water. <laughs> I wanted to see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you know, like the seafloor spreading, but, uh, and, but we have ways of getting around this, and one of the fundamental ways, of course, is by mapping the shape of the bottom using echo sounders and very sophisticated systems right now. And these systems provide us with the base maps, just like a field geologist would use uh, to look at the shape of a terrain and to drape the geology onto the shape of that terrain. Of course, the shape of that terrain tells us something about the processes that go on there. And here's just one example. This is uh, a map of part of the East Pacific Rise just off Mexico. You can see some long stretches of the East Pacific Rise spreading center. It's spreading at about, uh, the plates are separating at a full rate of about, oh, about 12 centimeters per year. Uh, you can see that the shallow areas that are kind of an orange color that those are like really long volcanoes. Uh, lavas are just uh, spilling out of these areas and creating this very strongly lineated terrain. You know, it's interesting. If we drained away the oceans, the planet would be dominated by this sort of corduroy-like pattern uh, created by seafloor spreading. It produced by volcanic eruptions and faulting at those mid-ocean ridges. Here you can also see some interesting discontinuities, so-called overlapping spreading centers, and then some big transform faults that offset those, uh, those spreading centers. But seafloor is being created here actively. This is the most active volcanic area on our planet, and yet ironically, we've never seen a volcanic eruption down there. We've seen some volcanic eruptions on the, around the edges of Hawaii, for example. Maybe some of you have seen that on the Big Island. Uh, we've seen some in the Western Pacific around some subduction zones, but never on the mid-ocean ridge system. So there's a lot of guessing that we have to do, or maybe I should say inference, uh, that we need to apply to understand the processes there. Another uh, technique that we use besides studying the active spreading centers, is to go to some of these older areas in the ocean. This is a place called Hess Deep. 
it's about twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And you know, on the order, as you see from the scale here, we're talking about um, a couple, it's about 150 kilometers long. It's a huge gash in the earth. It's a place where the earth is being pulled apart in, a, in Rift Valley, much like in uh, the East African Rift. And you can see, here's that East Pacific Rise Cross with the lineations you can see at the top and bottom. And it's ripping right through that material. So it creates a gigantic road cut, a gigantic uh, natural cross section of the oceanic crust. And this, because these escarpments, these cliffs on the side are so high, we can basically go right down through the oceanic crust and sort of look at the stratigraphy of the oceanic crust, just as you can see the different layers of rocks as you go down through the Grand Canyon. And so this gives us uh, a place where we can look directly at those rock types. Another important approach that we use uh, is drilling directly into the oceanic crust. We use the Joy East Resolution run out of Texas A&M University, uh, the uh, ocean drilling program, and also a Japanese drill ship, the Chiki, which is now also being used for these purposes. We also have one more trick that we use, and that is using old ocean floor that we find in mountain belts. We just find these sort of big splinters, mountain-sized splinters of oceanic rocks. And from them, we can reconstruct a relatively simple layered structure, which we think matches up really well with the geology in the oceanic crust. At the top of the stack, uh, underneath deep water sediments, we see these lumpy pill lavas. We'll see more about those in a minute. These are distinctive lava forms uh, that form underwater, and especially at mid-ocean ridges. We see this sheeted dike complex in the upper right here. You can see the individual, about three foot wide, uh, individual slabs that are the frozen cracks that magma filled as the seafloor was pulled apart. In the lower right, you can see the magma chamber rocks, the gabbros, the coarse grained rocks that slowed coolly down in the middle of the crust. All of these overlie mantle rocks, which are also exposed in those ophiolite complexes. And this is a great technique where you get a, can walk around on these rocks on land. On the other hand, uh, there are a lot of aspects uh, of these areas that are controversial and they're hard to match up with the specific place where they might have formed in the ocean. So it's hard to match it up with specific processes. Okay, to do geology on the bottom of the ocean, we use a lot of fancy technology. And I'll show you some of the details of some of these things. We use uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, this one you can see, obviously designed by some geeks who spent too much time watching Star Trek. Uh, there's a, something called a side scan sonar unit that produces a uh, sort of air photograph-like image that we can use for mapping geology on the seafloor. And we also use human-occupied and remotely operated vehicles that allow us to do detailed sampling. So here we're going to see our, our autonomous vehicle. It's like a drone, basically, on the sea. So you can see all of these fabulous details. And you know, this is an incredible advance. I mean, all geologists know that these shapes speak to us about processes, right? You can see these sort of scoop-shaped landslide scars, uh, linear uh, uh, escarpments here that are probably fault zones, these flat areas that are probably covered by undisturbed terrain. I mean, this is a great way to start out. But we still need to get down and look at the rocks. One of the ways we do that are with these remotely operated vehicles. These are fantastic in that they're on, they're on a, have a fiber optic cable. You can see the big cable attached there that has to be, uh, it's like a giant extension cord. We send power down so we can operate lights and we can bring video and other data back up on that fiber optic cable. Uh, there are mechanical arms, robot arms on here and lots of lights so we can actually use these for mapping the geology on the seafloor. But my favorite way to go to the seafloor is being there. And it's using uh, human-occupied vehicles like Alvin. And it's literally a spaceship to go to the bottom of the ocean. 
completely self-contained. It's not attached to the surface in any way. Uh, inside here, there's a two meter titanium sphere. Uh, that sphere is about three inches thick. Uh, you can see a few ports, one's right there, one's right in the front. Tiny circular windows that allow you to look out when you're on the bottom of the ocean. It's totally dark on the bottom of the ocean, so there have to be gigantic batteries in Alvin that power lights, cameras, and navigational equipment and computers on board the submarine. Uh, this, most of this white material is actually uh, just for flotation. It's a solid closed cell foam. Uh, there's nothing inside the little red top there. It's basically just a place to store some ropes and things like that. Uh, but inside here, this, as I say, two, two meter titanium sphere. It's like being in a small compact car with two other people and a bunch of computers. Uh, the, we can go down to maximum depth about 4,500 meters. That's a couple miles down, right? And uh, a pilot and two observers typically go uh, inside the ball. It's basically atmospheric conditions. It's kind of cold and damp in the craft, uh, but you know, it's very exciting to be down there to look out the windows and see the geology on the seafloor. Typically, we go down for six to eight hours at a time, and no, there's no restroom, so uh, that's, there are some issues with that. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like inside, I mean, here's one of the viewports, here's my knees here. This is just taking pictures inside the, the submarine. Here's the titanium hull, you can see, and all the switches and gadgets here that operate video cameras uh, and digital cameras that we use to document what we see on the seafloor. The pilot sits just over to the right here, and you can see he's, there's my other knee, so he's, he's like right on top of me basically, sitting on kind of a, a, an orange crate. And uh, he operates the submarine and operates the mechanical arms and so forth so he can grab samples at various times. The submarine weighs about 16 tons, so that's 16 tons dangling on a single rope there. Uh, it's lowered into the ocean. And this is a nice, calm day, so it's not too exciting, but you can imagine that it, it's, it's a little dicey when the weather's bad. And lots of times you, you just can't dive because you can't launch the submarine. Uh, it's dangled off the back of the research vessel on the large A-frame. These divers uh, detach uh, the, all of these ropes and lines. And then the ship just basically pulls away from the submarine. The submarine fills its ballast tanks with water and sinks to the bottom. It sinks to the bottom because it has some steel plates attached to the side. When you get to the bottom, rendering the submarine uh, neutrally buoyant is a matter of just dropping off some of those weights and adjusting the buoyancy so you can just fly the submarine around over the terrain. And it's fantastically exciting and, and fun. On the way to the bottom, it takes about an hour and a half to get there, and uh, it's, it makes for a very long and intense day of work. Uh, on the, just as an illustration of the environment on the bottom, we often decorate uh, sort of Dunkin' Donuts type styrofoam coffee cups, put them in mesh bags on the outside of the submarine, and when we bring them back to the surface, they've been completely squashed down to sort of a thimble size, a uh, little dense uh, cup like this. Okay, so when you get to the bottom of the ocean, uh, it's really a pretty stark reminder that you're in a place that you're on the planet Earth, but it's like a different planet. It's a planet where the ambient conditions are just completely different from on land. There's no light that penetrates that deeply into the ocean. It's totally dark, so you have to have lots of batteries and lights down there. Uh, the temperature is relatively constant. There's no weather. Uh, in Houston, you will appreciate that there's no rain there. <laughs> the, the pressures are extreme, and in fact, most of the bottom of the ocean is just covered with a smooth blanket of mud. That mud's produced just by the tiny organisms that lived in various depths in the oceans, lived and died, and their little shells and carcasses piled up on the bottom of the ocean to make this mud, kind of like dust settling on furniture that's neglected, like in my house. <laughs> but when you go to the youngest parts of the ocean, uh, where the mid-ocean ridges are creating new ocean floor, we see these beautiful uh, clefts in the sea floor, 
uh, where this ocean's being pulled apart and young volcanic rocks uh, that are, because they're very young, have no sediment cover on them at all. Uh, our, our detailed mapping of the surface of those often show that there's a tiny, tiny little uh, ditch that you can see here. That ditch is you know, not as wide as the museum here. And that's where all the lava is pouring out uh, of the seafloor and spilling down the edges of the uh, spreading center. And you can see the scallop lumpy pattern uh, shown in these slightly different colors corresponding to different depths uh, that show those lava flows going down the side of the spreading center. Overall, this schematic picture gives a sense of what that looks like. It's a loose pile of uh, loosely constructed lavas, mostly these lumpy pillow lavas and some more sheet-like lavas that are formed, cut by lots of fractures and cracks uh, that result in the upper part of the crust really being kind of a spongy sort of area with full of water and uh, in the cracks down in the rocks. That turns out to be important because these are areas where there's fantastic evidence of biological activity on our planet. Here's some of the really young lavas. It's black, shiny. You can tell when you're looking at really young material. Uh, it, as it ages, this material gets, you know, much duller looking. Here's a typical picture of some of those pillow lavas on the seafloor. They have this very distinctive lumpy kind of uh, form. Here's a microscope slide on the upper right showing just a few needle-like crystals that form in that material. In other places, the lava flows have completely different shapes. Sometimes they're just as flat as a parking lot. And it's amazing. Well, why are these different? It's the same composition material. Uh, something about the physical conditions during the eruptions must be different, right? But we've never seen the eruptions happening down on the seafloor. Well, one of the ways we're trying to address this is by uh, making our own lava. Here's some young lava. Here's some uh, older material. And we make this lava at Syracuse University. We make these beautiful, what are called pahoy hoy lava flows, these nice ropey lavas, very much like what we see on the seafloor. And uh, I do this in conjunction with my colleague, uh, Professor Robert Kwasaki, who's shown here with our furnace. This furnace uh, has a uh, cauldron in it, a crucible that's made of silicon carbide. You can see in the upper right there. And it can hold about half a ton of molten basalt, half a ton of molten real lava. The same kind of material that erupts on the seafloor. Our furnace tilts over so we can dump it out under controlled conditions and do experiments to make different shaped lava flows and understand the dynamics of how lava behaves as well as what those lava flow shapes mean. And here's just a, a selection of different shaped lava flows. Uh, if we, uh, from left to right, uh, the slope is getting less and less. Uh, the temperature is a little less and the rate that we pour the lava is less. So by varying those three important parameters, we make very different shaped lava flows. Of course, as geologists, we only, when we see a lava flow, for example, on the seafloor, well, we didn't say it erupt. So what we'd like to do is work backwards, look at the shape, and be able to say something about those smooth temperature effusion rate, that is the pouring rate, and so forth. Uh, you can see that sometimes these are very narrow and kind of channelized. Uh, sometimes they make simple sheets. Sometimes they make insulated tubes uh, that the lava travels through and breaks out down at the tip. And other times they make weird amoeboid-like, messy-looking lavas, looking a little bit more like those pillow lavas. But these lavas were all poured on land, right? Lava, lavas on the seafloor have these pillow shapes. And so, of course, we want to try to make those. When we do those in a, sort of a small swimming pool. This is a, looking vertically downward. Here's the trough where we're pouring the lava out of the furnace into the water uh, inside this big tank. You can see a bunch of skewers there. Those are thermal couples to measure the temperature of the lava. And you can see we're taking photographs and so forth to document what goes on. And let's see if uh, this video won't work for us. So you can see one of our experiments. Uh, one of the things you might anticipate is that, oh, well, it might be very explosive because that water will be turned to steam immediately. And in fact, that doesn't happen. Uh, the lava sort of fractures in a very fine way. And, and it's fragmented. You see lots of those 
pieces breaking off and raining down. And you can see a crust forming on the lava flows. The crust breaks through periodically and new lobes form. Uh, so we're making something that's just like the pillow lavas we see on the Mid Ocean Ridges. There's a nice big building that we did there. Okay, the lava here is about 1200 degrees centigrade. That's about 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's just incredibly hot, about five times hotter than your stove goes at home. And this is real uh, basaltic lava, uh, just almost the same composition as what erupts on the mid ocean ridges. Okay, so those lavas are forming the whole upper part of the oceanic crust from our drilling and from looking at some of those big cliffs on the seafloor. Underneath them, we can see those sheeted dike complexes, and we can also see the coarse grain magma chamber rocks, the gap, gap road rocks of uh, the middle part of the crust. And here's just a quick family of pictures of those. Here's a cross section of those pillow lavas, a slice down through that pile. Here's some of those sheeted dikes, those individual slabs, each one about a meter wide. Uh, some coarse grain gabbroic rocks, they're much less exciting looking, they're just sort of a massive wall of material. And then some wonderful fault zones that show us where uh, water has penetrated into the rocks and where there's been some mineralization as well. Uh, we also know a lot about uh, some of these rock types by going to these opiolite complexes, these ancient uh, slabs of oceanic material that are in the mountain belts. Okay. And that magma chamber material is particularly interesting. These beautiful, almost stained glass window type uh, pictures uh, are possible uh, when we look at the rocks uh, under the microscope. And all the minerals that are formed here, uh, the order in which they form, the composition of those minerals, those are kind of windows into the, how those magma chambers develop. Another important thing that we find on the bottom of the ocean that it represents the place where hot water is interacting with the rocks, these hydrothermal vents. And these are so-called black smoker vents. This isn't really black smoke. This is just hot water full of sulfide particles. That sulfide is critically important because microbes, bacteria in particular, live off of that sulfur. that hot water sort of serving up the nutrients to those bacteria. Those bacteria form the base of the food chain on the bottom of the ocean in these sort of like oases, these isolated areas where hot water comes blasting out uh, of the seafloor. Uh, these were discovered only in 1977, uh, so this is really a, a new field of study in a lot of ways. Uh, they're found in all spreading centers, that it's that hot heat of magma that drives, causes the circulation of hot water that rises in cooler water that sinks back down into the crust. That circulation pattern develops. Both the rocks and the fluids are changed by that process, right? Uh, temperatures of that water coming out can be as much as 400 degrees Celsius. I, some of you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, right? But that's in atmospheric conditions. Under a mile of water, the pressure is so high that that fluid cannot boil. Uh, the pressures are huge, as we talked about before, and these fluids are strongly enriched in some metals, uh, methane, carbon dioxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and these are slightly acid fluids. Uh, and they support these diverse biological communities around these black smoker vents. Uh, they, these are probably the highest temperature uh, living organisms on our planet. So here's a diagram just illustrating that sort of process. The magmatic heat warms up the water that's down in the cracks in the rocks. 
uh, it, it becomes less dense, it rises, it travels upward through fractures, especially fault zones, and, and to the seafloor where it comes blasting out, as you saw a moment ago. Uh, as that is pulled out, cooler water is pulled back down in, sinks back down in to replace it. Uh, both the fluids uh, that take the sulfides and other material out of the rocks, dissolve it out of the rocks, and bring it to the surface where the bacteria live on it, uh, and the rocks are also altered. They're depleted in, in uh, uh, sulfur, for example. These are basically seafloor kaiser <coughs> systems, and they represent a really exotic and strange kind of life on the seafloor. Uh, the microbes have to live in a very narrow place, in that sort of Goldilocks place where it's not too hot. Remember, it's maybe 400 degrees C in that black, smoky-looking material, and maybe only 2 degrees C out in the water away from it. So they have to live right in the margins. And those tiny organisms then are eaten by successively larger <coughs> organisms in an ecosystem that lives entirely without sunlight on the bottom of the ocean. And so this is very different from what we're used to seeing on land, where photosynthesis is produced, chlorophyll-producing plants, that in sunlight, making leaves and so forth and at the base of the food chain. No, this is called chemosynthesis, a chemical-based system uh, where it's those microbes that are basically eating the rocks uh, served up by the hot water on the bottom of the ocean. It's interesting that these may be models for kinds of life systems that could exist on other planets. It's given birth to the uh, field of astrobiology. Here's a, a video of just driving around one of these black smoker vents, you see the material just blasting out like a fire hose. And uh, this is where those microbes have to be uh, concentrated. All of the white flecks that you see there, those are shrimp. It's just teeming with shrimp. Uh, on one dive we made, we collected some of the shrimp in one of these places. And of course, we thought we were going to eat them, you know. We're, this is, looks like it'd be great. We're going to eat the, the hydrothermal shrimp. But, but no, they've been eating the sulfur. So of course they were like smelled like rotten eggs. Yeah, there was no, no question about eating them at all. I also want to point out these structures that are built. They're produced when those hot waters interact with the cold seafloor. Minerals precipitate uh, there. And the minerals are basically include, well, technically anhydrite and pyrite. So it's basically something like wallboard and fool's gold that is what builds these sort of structures. And these are the areas that are inhabited then by these really crazy organisms. One of the things we've learned over just the last few years by sampling and looking at these uh, different systems uh, on different parts of the mid-ocean ridge system is they're all different. You know, and just like we have, you know, kangaroos in <coughs> Australia, uh, we only have, for example, uh, some of the giant tube worms that we see that are shown in some of these pictures. Uh, we only find those in the East Pacific Rise, and we only find certain kinds of mussels on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So it's clear that these don't communicate real effectively. Somehow they're kind of isolated, even though the base of the food chain, the nutrients, the basic mechanisms that support these systems are all about the same. Okay, so let's let's look a little bit at slow spreading ridges like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge just a little bit. Then remember that slow spreading ridges, we have these big rift valleys developing. This, this rift valley that's highlighted in blue between the shallower yellow areas there. You can see this, the big fault scarps on the edges there. That's about 10 kilometers wide, right? So we're looking at about a, almost a 100 kilometer length of the ridge axis, like all rift zones. It's segmented, that is, there are individual pieces of rift that are kind of linked end-to-end, -end, kind of like uh, little linked sausages or something. Here's that same part of Rift Valley over here on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see in this case, it intersects a big transform fault just at the uh, top of the diagram. Just like on the East Pacific Rise, typical seafloor spreading there makes this sort of global corduroy pattern that you can see over on the left-hand side of the diagram. But notice over here toward that rift valley again, there's this big mountain with the white on top and some other weird shaped mountains that don't look like that simple corduroy pattern. And they've got <coughs> lineations that go in the opposite direction. They're kind of parallel to that spreading direction. And 
these are areas where there are giant fault zones on the seafloor. And here's an example, a little closer up view of one of these that creates these huge dome-like mountains that we call core complexes. Uh, on top, we can see those striations on the top, sort of scratches that form on those big fault zones. The fault zones sort of arch over the top of the mountains. And if you look at the depth here, I just want to uh, highlight that this mountain is about the size of Mount Rainier. You know, We're talking about something that's about 14,000 feet high and about 20 kilometers across. You know, it's a huge mass of material. Here's another one, a close-up of one of these fault zones showing one of what's called a side scan sonar image. And again, here's a, a, a fault zone that you can walk on with these very distinctive scratches on the surface. Uh, you can walk on that for several miles. And these are huge faults that are ripped apart the ocean floor. Uh, the rocks that we see there show the signs of that faulting. The nice igneous looking textures you can see in the lower left there are replaced by metamorphic fabrics of various kinds that tell us about the details of the faulting. But we, the way we think these core complexes form is basically underneath the rift valley, shown in the middle part of this diagram, uh, and the pink seafloor there. Uh, the, basically that big fault where the red arrow starts uh, arches its way up, and as the plates are pulled apart, basically the material that forms deep underneath the spreading center is basically pulled out, kind of like pulling a, a carpet out from underneath a piano or, or a couch. So you get that deep level stuff. The carpet comes out where you can see it on the seafloor. <coughs> Here's another cross-sectional diagram showing the same thing. The purple material uh, being pulled out from underneath the rift valley on the right, out, out from underneath. All those crustal rocks that we talked about before, the lavas, the dikes, the magma chamber rocks. In this case, the material that gets pulled out, the fault zone is so big that it's pulling material out from the Earth's mantle. And that creates a very special and interesting circumstance where we have these big exposures of mantle rocks up on top of these mountains. <coughs> The mantle rocks are made up primarily of this mineral called olivine. If anybody's birthday is in August, your birthstone's a peridot, right? Olivine is the same thing. Peridot is just the gem quality. Uh, uh, peridot is the gem quality olivine. When water is added to the structure of olivine on a molecular level, it turns into this other rock called serpentine. And you can see where it gets its name. It has that sort of snaky skin to it. Well, a couple interesting things here. Happened. First off, the rocks are changed from olivine to serpentine. But when that happens, it turns out it's an exothermic reaction. That is, it heats up. If you've ever uh, had the bad experience of breaking an arm or something like that and had a cast on, you know when that cast, it mixes the plaster of Paris with water, it heats up, right? Eventually it cools off, but it initially it heats up. Same thing happens here. This material heats up. Creating that heat is sufficient to cause hydrothermal circulation in the crust. You know, instead of having magma chambers, we've got this, these serpentinization vents developed. Uh, another interesting thing has happened uh, here is the rocks swell. Uh, that's important because the rocks begin to crack and it allows more water to get in and keep that process going. The fluids are changed as well. The fluids that come, interact end up with a very high pH so instead of being slightly acid, like the black smoker fluids, they're high pH. In fact, the pH can be as high as 11. It's sort of like Drano. It's just remarkably caustic material. And uh, also creates uh, reducing conditions that can cause some interesting uh, organic synthesis. And one of the things that happens here, because of the high pH fluids, when they hit that cold seawater, uh, it, they precipitate calcium carbonate, kind of like limestone. These are basically upside-down stalactites. These are places where that hot water is buoyant and traveling upward, it kind of washes up over the surface of these uh, features, and crystals precipitate on the edges of them. But, but they grow upward instead of downward, as stalactites in caves, for example. And, these are the things that we found at this so-called Lost City site. We found these huge towers 
some three stories, some as much as 10 stories tall, on top of these huge mountains, these core complexes, exposing those perinatides. Let's see if this is going to run. It's not happy. Okay, we can see this, uh, this material, this carbonate material, like limestone, they say, like stalactites, growing right out of the, the bedrock in these places. looked at them, I thought they were, they must be toxic or something like that, but we didn't see anything living there. But instead, we can see there's all this filament-like material, kind of looks like linguine looking. And it's, this is bacterial material. It turns out that there's lots of life even in these crazy places. Imagine this stuff's living in drain of like conditions. So this is a whole different uh, ecological system, completely different from uh, the black smoker type systems. This is a place where just adding water to the rocks causes a hydrothermal circulation system that can support life. It's a whole other way that we can think about possible ways for organisms to exist on another planet, right? or for the origin of life. Turns out when we look at these sorts of organisms and their molecular makeup, and believe me, I don't, can't go very deeply into the biology here, but this is what's called the tree of life, and sort of a, a map of how similar different organisms are in terms of their molecular structure. And uh, three different main branches here is bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Eukarya, I mean, that's us. Those are organisms that have cells with nuclei, and we're way out here, far, far out here, were very evolved from the original place where these three branches split off, that sort of biological, molecular garden of Eden, if you like. And so before you get to feeling too good about how evolved you are, I just want to point out that the nearest neighbor there is corn. <laughs> <laughs> we're about as evolved as corn in, in, this, in, in this diagram. You can see that some of the bacteria are pretty highly evolved. But at the black smoker vents and at this Lost City site in particular, some of the most primitive organisms near that triple point where those organisms branch off, uh, the very oldest, most primitive organisms, those are what we're finding in those places. And it may be a hint that we're looking at the kind of organisms that uh, are the oldest on our planet. Anyhow, so I hope I try to give you a little tour of the Mid-Ocean Ridge system. So the, um, exciting processes going on in systems on the seafloor. And uh, these, you can uh, see a lot more pictures uh, from this in our new book. Uh, you can find chapters on all of these sorts of topics. And one of my main messages to all of you, and especially to the young people who are here, is, you know, there's just an awful lot we don't know about our planet yet. It's not all known. And I think we all need to go out there and find out about those things. So thanks so much for being here tonight. We can take a few questions. Does anybody in the audience have a question? Yeah, the seafloor. Yeah, we've used it all the time on the seafloor. And in fact, with some of these ROVs, we can do almost everything we can do from Alvin. 
In fact, in some ways, it's more efficient to use the ROVs because they can stay down for days at a time rather than just going up and down sort of like an elevator every day. Thank you. <laughs> if not, yeah. oh, another question here. Good. Uh, Right. Have we found any economically uh, viable deposits? Well, the, the key word here is economical. I mean, it's obviously very expensive to go to sample those types of material. Uh, nothing on the mid-ocean ridges, but in the western Pacific, uh, high temperature hydrothermal systems that are very much like the ones we see on the mid-ocean ridges are actively being staked and mined by Australian companies. Uh, how, how deep can life exist in the oceans? And, you know, basically uh, as deep as we've ever gone. Uh, it doesn't look like pressure is a real limitation for life in the oceans, even in the deep sea trenches. And I should mention the James Cameron film that's going to be shown tonight, uh, going even down to the depths of like 11 kilometers, uh, farther below sea level than Mount Everest goes above sea level. Uh, there's still organisms living there. And in fact, I'm sure there are organisms living deep in the rocks in the Earth. In fact, many people believe that most of the biomass on our planet is not us and the dogs and plants and trees and grass that we're all familiar with, but instead it's these tiny, tiny microbes that live down in the cracks in the rocks, probably down at least one or two kilometers down into the Earth's crust. One more question here. The laboratory Yeah, really good question. What's the pressure effect on our lava experiments? And it's a pretty big one for the pillow lavas because just as boiling is suppressed at the hydrothermal vents, so uh, that fragmentation and boiling of water and expansion of water that caused the fracturing that you can see of that material, that's also suppressed for deep sea pillow lavas. So that's something we're thinking about how we can uh, manage, how we can get around that. And uh, that obviously that'll be a big challenge for us. Dr. Carson, we really want to say uh, thank you one more time. And I think Charles uh, Sternbach has a gift for you as our speaker. This is a beautiful globe that shows all of the mid ocean spreading in beautiful colors. And you have that. So thank you once again. This time we're going to have a 10 minute health break and if you could be back here promptly at uh, 15 after 10, we'll start the movie Deep Sea Challenge 3D with James Cameron. Get your 3D glasses if you don't already have them.